Why pay more for your precious metals from the big guys with offices on Wall Street and who bank with J.P. Morgan? From the basics like eagles, maples, rounds, and bars, to collector coins like the Silver Shield and Heroes SD War Collection, to our exclusive line of insurance-approved TL-rated precious metal safes, SD Bullion has what you're looking for at the lowest prices, period. Guaranteed. Find out why over 15,000 new customers have recently made the switch to buying their gold and silver from the dock. Give our team an opportunity to earn your business today at SD Bullion. Why pay more? This is the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. Joining us today is our good friend Craig Hemke, uh, the turd himself from TF Metals Report. It's great to have you back, Craig. Hey, what's up, Doc? Never gets old, as I say every time, but... We've had, uh, finally, a nice uh, sustained uptrend uh, week here in gold and silver. Um, silver is trading back above 16. Gold is uh, up, what, about $80 off the recent lows. Broken 11.90 a couple of times here in the last uh, 24 hours. Uh, consolidating a little bit here this afternoon around the, the mid-1180s. But perhaps more importantly, both gold and silver currently are for the second straight day. Um, above their 200-day moving averages, so let's get your take here to start, Craig, on what we look, what we're looking at here in gold and silver. We have had a, a bit of a sustained rally. Are we do for a bit of a pullback, or might we see a bit of a move higher here as we've pierced the 200-day? Well, it's first and foremost, it's very encouraging, and I, as you look backward now on the price charts, as we go back through last summer, that final washout and hopefully it was the final washout is starting to look like it was the final washout you know we had that uh gold is nothing but a pet rock story that magically showed up in the wall street journal on friday july 17th and then on sunday night the 19th gold gets smashed for 50 dollars and a whole bunch of stops get run but we never got any lower than 1080 and we bounced around there for a good part of several weeks and then have now since moved higher and moved back above where we were before the pet rock story came out. So you almost got kind of a false breakdown. Same thing in silver. In fact, if you look at the silver chart, we broke down through 1550, and now it looks like a pretty clear reverse head and shoulder bottom on kind of a false breakdown. So there are a number of reasons to feel optimistic, I think, long-term that maybe finally after three years we're putting this behind us. I mean, the, the long-term downtrend in the yen has been broken a, a couple of weeks back too. So... Uh, fundamentally, long term, all that kind of stuff, lots of reasons to be at least feeling a little bit better uh, about things. But as we know, if you follow the paper markets, man, it's it's never straight up. It's always three steps forward and two steps back, you know, that kind of thing. As the bullion banks, you know, those malevolent, altruistic, and malevolent, benevolent, altruistic, malevolent, there's a, that's the right way I should put it. Um, those bullion banks that make a market, you know, they just issue all this paper to eventually absorb all of this demand coming in from the specs that are chasing the momentum and and really some fundamental reason, you know, this rationale understanding that the Fed's never going to raise rates. And so gold and silver have gone up, but by issuing all that paper, eventually the the momentum will kind of dry up and we will take a few steps back. I was worried we'd do that at the 200-day, but we've moved through. I think there are some targets now that we can look at. I, there's a clear downtrend for just 2015 in silver that comes in at about 1680. If we were to get up and touch that, that might be the spot where we would roll over and go down for a little while. But again, that's only from a trading standpoint. Long term, as you look at how things have performed here, especially since that last false breakdown 90 days ago, I think we look okay. You discussed that so much more eloquently before we uh, turn the recorder on, though, Craig. <laughs> well, you know, I've, <laughs> I've, I've been drinking since noon, Doc, and so, uh, and I didn't get my nap today, so I really don't know, you know. Yeah, what did I... You, you, you were dropping F-bombs before we pushed the record button. Oh, is that what it was? <laughs> well, I can give they're you get, They're getting ready to F everybody, was the quote. <laughs> uh, that w And that would be the case, you know. The was telling everyone to bend over. Well, and, and and it is then that is true. You know, when we talk about it. You know, the uh, you know a more gentle term is uh, fleecing. You know that these yeah. that these sheep get led into the fleecing barn. You know, like they're down there in Queensland someplace. You know, to get shorn. <laughs> uh, and that's really the case. And and 
what and we I, and that's absolutely what happens. And I but I get a lot of people that always ask, well, how come they keep falling for the same tricks every time? And you got to understand, most of these trading funds and HFT funds and and commodity funds and stuff, hedge funds. They don't give a rat's ass about silver or gold. They're just simply chasing the momentum dot on their screen and increasing an allocation, you know, putting 2% of their money to work in gold futures or something. And if they buy at the absolute wrong time only to get their throats ripped out by the some JP Morgan trader, you know, that's just that as long as the other 90% is 98 is percent is okay. And if, if their zig is zagging and you know, all that kind of stuff, and they're collecting their two and 20, the fact that they got fleeced again by you know, a bullion bank trading desk, I don't think really registers on their uh, on their screens. And so that's what's that's what we're coming, that's what we're building toward again, though. Unfortunately, o open interest just yesterday as gold surged through. Yesterday being Wednesday, as gold surged through that 200-day moving average, here comes all this momentum trading. Open interest in gold went up by almost 16,000 contracts, or 4% in a day. All this new buying, the banks issue all this brand new paper, and now all they've got to do to chase all that back out is just to pull the rug out from under gold with a midnight raid, jam it back under the 200-day, and watch all that momentum chasing money go right back out. And so that'll be the two steps forward for the back that we for the three we just took forward. And that's why, you know, most folks, I think, are wise to this. And they realize really your your best long term strategy is to just keep accumulating physical while you can. Yeah. And, and to answer that question that people ask you, well, when is the day going to come when they actually are not going to be able to pull these games? When are we actually going to go higher where the cartel doesn't have the ability of uh, in keeping prices under a lid or even pushing them further down? And that's happening. I mean, it, it, you cannot have a, um, a, a commodities futures market and COMEX uh, operating on a long-term basis with any degree of confidence in the system if their you know, inventories continue to decline. And we're seeing that happen. And we're seeing confidence in the system happen. We're seeing interest in the precious metals market in terms of the market makers and so forth moving eastward, where everybody, including the Western bullion banks, want a piece of the action on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Uh, you know, the under, underlying physical market is having its impact on the paper market, and at some point, uh, you have to have higher prices to allocate the, the scarce commodity that is gold and silver. No we're doubt. Already, we're having shortages this year. I mean, silver is going to be in a supply deficit vis-a-vis -vis, uh, mine supply and, and, uh, and demand. So... Uh, in the market, after four long, painful years, the best uh, remedy for a bear market is, in fact, the bear market is depressed pricing, changing the market dynamics. The cartel can't change the laws of economics forever. Not forever. You're right. And, and that's an excellent point, Eric. And, and, and to that point, we noticed, and I, you, you guys and I probably talked about this last fall, as the spec algos drove price down following the yen down last fall, Price got all the way down to 11.30 or 40, and at that point, it almost seemed as if the paper market nearly broke. And we wrote about this all the time, all through the fall, about kind of a physical floor in gold near 11.50 because it was during that the last two months of the year last year. Remember the backwardation and the negative GoFo rates in London just went through the roof from a historical basis as a sign of physical stress, and it dragged the market higher, went all the way up to what, thir uh, tw whatever it got to, like 1320 or whatever it was uh, back in January before it was capped and slammed back down. But there is kind of a physical floor there, and again, we're now back above those levels, we're back up to 1185 or whatever today. We're back above, you know, they tried to smash it down and it couldn't keep it down in August. So there really is kind of a physical floor to it. You know, we got all this anecdotal evidence, all these different dots that you can connect, you know, whether it's the retail shortages that you guys have been talking, you know, everybody's been aware of for the last several weeks. But one of those things you mentioned, Eric, is that uh, low registered uh, stock on the COMEX. Now, right now today, it's 171,000 ounces and change is all the registered gold the COMEX shows. And what everybody needs to know is you know registered is that eligible for delivery gold and and eligible gold is the stuff that they just have in storage it's not ready to be deliverable but these banks can in a journal entry just move gold it seems back and forth from one category to the next so we have 171,000 ounces of registered gold it could be 371,000 tomorrow with the couple of keystrokes okay 
So that's that's kind of the caveat everyone needs to remember. But it's been at this record low now for almost a month, and no gold has been moved. Additionally, October is a delivery month, as they call it on the COMEX. It's nothing like what December will be. It's probably the lightest delivery month of the year. But as we entered the delivery month, there were 3,100 contracts that appeared to be standing for delivery. On first notice day, when you've got to have 100% margin in your account to hold an October contract, there were 2,800 contracts standing still. As of last night, we're down to 1,000. But yet there have only been 200 deliveries made. All the while, this total amount of registered gold doesn't move. Makes you wonder, well, one, where do the 1,800 contracts go? They obviously just liquidated for cash instead of standing. That's pretty unusual. It's extremely unusual with registered gold as low as it is. And we have another one of these data points that it makes it seem as if these gold banks are living off of flow. You know, kind of hand to mouth, just trying to keep things afloat as long as they can. Now, they can keep things afloat a lot longer than, than anybody would expect. However, as of this moment, again, recognizing that gold can be journaled from one category to the next, uh, you know, as, as much as they'd like. As of this moment, there are 263 paper ounces for every one registered physical ounce of gold on the COMEX. 263 to one. That's, that's exploded in just you know, the last month or so. It was yeah, ex ago yeah that exactly. It was under 150 or whatever. And it because again, they could hey they could cut it to 131 to one by tomorrow sure. just simply by journaling over another 170 thousand ounces. But that that's another one of these data points that just make you wonder if again these paper markets have been stretched as far as they can. And yeah, two years just ago, can't. sixty to one was typical. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, getting back to that, as I kind of tie that back together, I think that just makes it increasingly likely, from all these different data points to looking at the charts to everything else, that yeah, you know what, the worst may be behind us. The yen clearly has turned, and that's been a driving force of driving paper gold down. The world is, I think, the whole investing world is finally realizing that all these central banks are just full of garbage. They don't, they don't have any other policy besides loosening and printing and devaluing that's the only thing they can do and as that realization sets in um then it's that loss of confidence and and all of this starts to push gold even higher so i think there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic that the worst is finally behind us and but we have to be cognizant of the fact that again it's never straight back up and it's always going to be a couple steps forward and one step back one uh, data point i can add in here uh, to your point about the physical floor particularly in uh, silver turd, is premiums we're seeing on, um, especially like the Silver Eagle, Silver Maples. Um, a couple of weeks back, silver is trading, spot price futures are trading about 14.50 an ounce, but uh, even in volume, a monster box size of Silver Eagles, they were $5 over spot or more in a smaller quantities. If you're buying a tube or 100 coins, you might be paying 5.50 or $6 over spot. So you were paying 19.50 to 20, 20.50 an ounce, for Silver Eagles, when silver is trading about 14.50 an ounce, silver has had a nice the futures price has had a nice run for a couple of weeks, trading in the low uh, 16, 16.20, and price of a Silver Eagle right now is about 19.70, $20 an ounce hasn't changed. How about that? Just like on the way down. Yeah, yeah, and that, that that's an important point as well, no doubt about it. That if you put it all together with the price action of the last year, the the fundamental realization that the Fed and the other central banks are full of crap, I think you can make a pretty compelling case with the charts and everything else that I think this is about as bad as it gets. And the miners, too. I mean, they tried to – how many times uh, – we follow the Huey Index at TF Metals Report. That thing came down and held the 105 level. I mean, like it was made out of steel for six, eight weeks. And now has just exploded to the upside. I mean, we you could make a pretty compelling case too that the worst after after what the Huey was six hundred a couple years ago it was four hundred back in two thirteen. The fact it's gone from a hundred to hundred and thirty does not mean that you've missed the boat. <laughs> There's a lot of room to go if we in fact have found a bottom. So, Craig, what's uh, your take on the uh, overall equities market outside of precious metals? What do you see going on? This, uh, uh, you know, two some odd weeks ago, we had the Federal Reserve dialing back expectations for normalization of interest rates, and now 
and conventional Wall Street folks are saying, well, maybe 50% odds are better. We have to wait all the way till June for the first interest rate hike. And the jobs numbers out a couple weeks back as well were, were pretty ugly, and that also helped turn sentiment around, both in terms of you know people trading in the equities market and precious metals. Um, now that we've got these paper traders coming back into the gold space as well, too, and, and uh, you know, it looks like you know, unconventional thinkers like Druckenmiller and, and other big money uh, people in the street are, are beginning to put positions in the precious metals, in part because they're looking around at all the other assets, stock markets, bonds, the high end of out, uh, valuations, and on and on. What, what's your take on the big picture and, and how that relates to the economy and precious metals in the long run? Well, it's it's important to follow the big picture because I you know I recognize that though my site's focused on gold and silver, I mean almost everybody's got an equity investment someplace. You know, I mean it'd be nice to be completely out of the system like Jim Sinclair talks about, but probably ninety nine percent of the people that visit my site and yours too, Doc and yours too, Eric probably have a four hundred one k or a, you know an IRA or something with some equity investments in it. And if you've made money back, if you know if you saw your four hundred one k get shaved in half in two thousand eight, but now you've seen it come back to where it's even higher than it was, the last thing you can afford since you're seven years older is to now you know get your trachea ripped out again, you know, and, and uh, by a, a big sharp drop in the in the stock market. So we got to be mindful of what's going on. Now, any stock market uh, discussion comes with the caveat that uh, unlike 2001 and 2008, the last two times we had a, you know, 50% bear market, uh, we're, the mark, the stock markets, every market now are so controlled, influenced, manipulated, you know, to all the varying degrees by the central banks that you know, I don't know how much all this cycle talk and wave talk and, you know, and just even looking at past performance can can really guide you because, like I said, if, if, if the Bank of Japan and the Fed can be in there manipulating the VIX and the dollar yen every day, maybe they can keep economic laws suspended for, for a little while longer. We'll see. Anyway, we've, we've been following it too at Metals Report ever since the stock market started breaking down in August. We've been looking at it from a historical basis over the last 25 years. And it's pretty easy to see that the, the bull market from 95 to 2000 and the bull market from 2003 to 2008, both of them ended with major significant down months. And so when August started playing out the way it did, even before August 24th, I started looking and I thought, man, if this ends up being down, that's going to be your signal. And that's in fact what happened. What then happened next in 2001 and then in 2008 those big down months were followed by kind of a dead cat bounce. We call it a green candle of hope. Where, oh, and you know what? That was just a temporary thing, a little correction. Everything's going to be fine. And then, kablamo, the bottom drops out. And like I said, in those two previous instances, the market was cut in half. All right. Well, we've had the first two things happen. We've had the ugly death candle in August. We've had this kind of green candle come back here on Thursday. We're at 2020 or so in the S&P. What's going to be the signal? What's ultimately the signal? I just shared with uh, Vault subscribers uh, today what I think ultimately the signal is, and it's a crossing of the moving averages. You know how that's kind of a you know the death cross or the you know golden cross and all the different technical terms that people use. If you go back and look, and anybody can do this, go to a site like investing.com or barchart.com, pull up an S and P chart, and plot on there. If you make it a monthly chart, plot a six-month moving average and a 24-month moving average. And you'll find, as if by magic, that at the end of those green candle bounces in 2001 and 2008, the six-month moving average bearishly crosses and moves under that 24-month. And almost immediately, the market goes to hell. I mean, down. Huge. Those... Two lines at present haven't crossed yet, but they're getting damn close. If, unless the stock market turns and rallies to a new all-time highs in the next few weeks, they're probably going to cross sometime before Thanksgiving, sometime maybe in early November. If and when they do, man, If like I said, if you're sitting there in stocks and you've been a beneficiary of all this easy money in the last six years and your retirement plan has grown, your 401k plan – God, you'd just be you'd be crazy not to move some to the sidelines. If you're really aggressive, you could get short and buy yourself some puts. But at least, if anything, now is not the time to be complacent. Man, I mean, history, if history is any guide, and like I said, it may not be because all these central banks are so heavily involved now. But if history is any guide, and those moving averages, again, the six-month and the 24-month, if they cross bearishly, consider yourself warned. 
it's an interesting signal. And we should probably say just a few words about technical analysis because, quite frankly, when at least half of our audience despises technical analysis. And when we put up stuff, you know, and, and so with doctors, the comment section is like, oh, this is a bunch of bullshit. Or, you know, it's completely worthless. You can't tell anything in a manipulated market on <laughs> And the, the important thing to note, you know, we're speaking about technical analysis and application in the context of trying to figure out where we are in the stock market. And we know as well from fundamental analysis that we're very richly valued, that all of the yep. m- enormous amount of liquidity that's been dumped into the system is the main reason why, in fact, we have the markets that we have today. And it's really just a question of time. Even just basic generic logic tells you that, given the duration of, of the bear and bull cycles that we see, we're long in the tooth. And, yeah. you know, Looking at these signals, and this is the take-home message for people who just do despise technical analysis, when you look at signals like this, you've got to understand that there's a very large amount of money under management around the world that's controlled by people who use technical analysis exclusively, as well as people with a very large pile of it by their own standards who use it as a, a significant uh, guidepost that um, you know, shapes their decision-making processes. So these things are important, and they're helpful to look out in, in the future and try to wrap one's brain around parameters, the probabilities by which uh, you know, market directions can move one way or another. And that's the, the, you know, even somebody who puts very little stock in, or you know, no pun intended, on the value of technical analysis, it's very helpful in that sense. It helps the uh, paint the landscape in terms of what can happen based on history and past tendencies and patterns in stocks. So I know you'd agree with that, Turd. I oh, no, no. It out there we, it, it, defense of technical analysis, I think, is worthwhile. People need to have an open mind when it comes to markets because, they, they, I mean, there's no greater humbling machine than the markets. Could I, it, it, if you don't mind, if, if, can Wait. I address that for a second? Because Absolutely. I get this all the time. Because I get yeah. people show up on my side or they troll me someplace and they'll say, technical analysis is useless in a manipulated market, as if they're telling me, Turd Ferguson, that yeah. somehow How the gold. How many times have you blammed your head against the wall from the, technical analysis? Or, or the, wrong. I mean, or the, no, 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 <laughs> no. What I mean is they're telling me that, that I don't understand that gold is manipulated? Yeah, right. What? No, the only reason I have a site. The only reason I've been doing this for five years is because gold is manipulated. And I understand that the banks use the TA against those trading funds you were just mentioning. That they can throw up roadblocks or they can, you know, go back to the February employment day, February the 6th or whatever it was. Gold rode the 200-day moving average for a week as if they were just waiting to pull the plug on it as soon as the NFP hit that Friday morning at 8.30. That's exactly what they did. And this is now the first time we've been over it since. So it's... People, yes, absolutely, the markets are manipulated. However, you got to understand, like you said, there are a lot of market participants that still follow these signals. Now, to that end, as it relates to the stock market, this is exactly the caveat I was just talking about. Because you can have all these charts, and you can look back at it historically, and your green candles of hope, and your death candles, and your moving averages, and all this kind of stuff. And it, if, the, if the Bank of Japan is going to print infinite levels of yen and use those yen uh, to pump up their stock markets to buy dollars and sell yen and drive the dollar yen to new highs the stock market's going to follow it because we've you know gone over that over and over about how closely correlated the stock market futures are to the dollar yen so the stock market may look like hell the 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 ta may tell you history may tell you it's about ready to go in the toilet but if the Bank of Japan is going to use infinite ability to sell yen and buy dollars and drive that in, that pair to a new high, the stock market ain't going down. <laughs> so you've got to just kind of recognize all this, and people have to take all of this into consideration. But I, I do think, though, I mean, there's at least a chance that if those moving averages cross, history repeats itself. And that's the point of going through this discussion so that people at least are wary and not right. complacent. That's all. <laughs> What's your take uh, on uh, what will happen in the metals if we do see that? Um, do you think we'll see an initial um, big takedown like we saw in 2008, 2009, or will they decouple? I, I, at this point, Doc, I, you know, again, I, I'm going to kind of hang my hat on, this, on these correlations, these HFT correlations, because I've been talking about on my site since last fall, 
I think maybe September of last year we started talking about this, how uh, by the Bank of Japan weakening the yen and all of these HFT algos correlating yen weakness with selling gold. And all anybody's got to do is, again, go to any of these charting sites and plot uh, a, a, a chart of the dollar yen, but invert it. So it's the yen dollar. So that as the yen's going down, the, the things, the yen dollar is going down. And then plot gold over it, and they move one for one. If you want to know why gold has moved counterintuitively for the last three years, you know, and QE started in 2012, and everybody thought, okay, here we go. And then all of a sudden, the debt and the deficit goes up, and the money supply goes up, and gold goes down. It's because gold was following the yen. Okay, so. Why would I be optimistic about paper going forward? Because that downtrend in the yen broke and broke rather decisively about eight weeks ago. And so if we're going to get into a, a time when commodities in general start doing better because uh, the dollar's getting weaker versus the yen, and that's going to drag gold up and silver up and the, you know kind of start generating its own positive momentum, then that's going to come at a time where the yen is rallying versus the dollar. And again, now the Bank of Japan doesn't like that. They've worked awful hard. They've had their, they've gone through a whole bunch of toner cartridges over the last three years, printing as many yen as they can get their hands on. Makes them mad. You saw it dollar yen reverse today, uh, rather dramatically, and drove the stock market higher. So it doesn't it doesn't mean that the yen's going to go straight back up and take paper gold with it. But if that trend is broken, if that three-year downtrend in the yen is broken, then probably the three-year downtrend in, in uh, paper gold is broken as well. So I, uh, regardless of everything else, um, you, know, you, you add on the, the Fed job owning and people figuring them out, I think all in total, I think things look pretty good for the metals. Uh, but again, not in just a straight line up unless you know the whole system breaks. Yeah, and then, Doc, you're talking about what could happen if we were looking at a 2008 scenario and how that would you know, shape the metals trading this time around. I think there are some things that we can say with certainty that are different this time around. We have, you know, the GLDs, the inventory roughly halved. We have common mm -hmm. total inventory. Never mind the whole sophomoric debate about registered versus, you know, eligible and how flipping back and forth makes that whole observation uh, moot. Well, it's not moot. I mean, the total inventory in the entire comic system is lower. You know, yeah. it, 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 the amount available in central banks is by prima facie evidence based on what we witnessed with the you know, machinations of Germany trying to repatriate their gold and other you know, strange anecdotal examples like that uh, promotional uh, virtual tour that was put on the Bank of England's website that Alistair McLeod had discovered and he noticed that the, the uh, uh, bar count was very different compared to what the Bank of England had put in their uh, most recent uh, annual yeah. report. I mean, on and on. The take-home point here is that there's not as much gold around waiting to be had to dump into the system for uh, meeting you know, a rush of, of uh, interest and demand that we saw in the later period of 2008 and 2009. It took a while for the precious metals markets to recover and then you know, you start moving a lot higher uh, in the last crash. And this time around, I mean, I think it's also a foregone conclusion that we could say with probably 100% certainty that it's going to take a lot less time for gold and silver to bounce back and start moving higher, we have kind of a systemic crash uh, coming out of the stock market or and or the bond market. Yeah, no doubt about it. And, and I would throw on too, Eric, on that argument, just a fundamental awareness. And I don't think anybody in 2008 sure. was thinking, God, the dollar's going to hell and I got to have some protection and sound money and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's still not a lot of people that understand the stuff that, that we talk about, but there's a lot more than there used to be. So I put and that on the awareness the too of well. manipulation. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's true too. It would be yeah. a I mean, ten years ago, an average participant in the marketplace would probably have been singing the songs, singing the phrases of capitalism and how great free markets are and whatnot. I mean, now <laughs> even an average person who's just getting started can't help but recognize how massively manipulated the bond market is, and yeah. the stock market Currency as well, markets. something that people are beginning to appreciate because yeah. it's just so in our faces. Yeah, no doubt about it, and and. You know, on top of all that, though, and, and all the stuff we've talked about uh, in the charts and everything else, uh, everything looks fine in the physical floors. But, you know, just as what, two weeks ago, there was a lot of concern about companies like Glencore, you know, 
and their massive exposure and how Glencore could be the next Enron slash Lehman, you know, slash WorldCom, you know, kind of scheme like that. Look, if if we get into that kind of disinflationary deleveraged spiral again here in the next weeks to months and the stock market goes to hell and uh, copper goes back, you know, down to a dollar 40 like it did in 2008 and crude goes back down to 35 like it was pushing, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. I mean, they're going to take silver pa or paper silver down with it. You know, there, there's a floor there and the premiums will expand and you won't be able to, like Doc said, you won't be able to buy physical at 12. It'll still be 1950 for a monster box. You know, that won't change. Uh, but there's nothing to stop the algos. If, if everything, all these other commodities get liquid, goes into liquidation mode, there's nothing to stop the algos from driving paper, gold and silver down too. So, I mean, this is, yeah, things look good and there's a lot of reason to be optimistic that the worst is behind us. And I'm not trying to make it sound like I'm trying to have it both ways. I'm just saying there's still reason for people to be cautious and to understand that the computers in, are in charge. And uh, if things go haywire, uh, we could still see some pretty significant volatility. And especially in the very near term, given that we just uh, popped over 200 day with the gold. Agreed. Telling us to bend over. <laughs> Get fleeced. <laughs> and, I, and, you know, one last thing, too. I, this geopolitical stuff, uh, man, oh, man. I just read on Zero Hedge this afternoon, you know, that this idea that the, the U.S. is going to float a bunch of warships through those little atolls that China's building out there. And how China said, don't do it or we're going to shoot at you, which they probably won't. But nonetheless... The U.S. is going to do that, they said, the next week. The next week? Oh, God, there's another thing to worry about. Uh, you've got all these Russian-American fighter planes in close proximity to each other over Syria and up against her. I mean, it's just, man, there's, you can see why my hair is falling out, and drinking all the time. There's an engagement chain story that was out uh, over the weekend. Right. I mean, the, the Royal uh, Air Force and the U.K. denied it and said, we didn't tell our, pli our pilots to, you know, freely engage Russian uh, airplanes if you feel you're being intimidated or threatened. I mean, you know, those, those kind of rules of engagement are in place uh, to prevent accidents. And in the fog of war, accidents happen. It's just the nature of the game. But it looks it, I, I think, frankly, that rules of engagement uh, instruction was real, and they just kind of felt embarrassed and denied it and said, oh, only the tabloids reported it. But, you know, logically, you have to ask yourself, where the heck would the tabloids come up with something like that? I mean, it's not the kind of thing that they would, you know, think of as uh, the perfect kind of story to manufacture out of full cloth. Put it all together, it makes it look like it was a bad week to quit sniffing glue. Uh, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> All right. Well, before we wrap up uh, the show this week, uh, Turd, if you can tell uh, the listeners where to find uh, your regular public work as well as uh, tell them a little bit about uh, the excellent and very um, inexpensive uh, subscription service you offer. Well, I appreciate that, Doc. And, Doc, I appreciate you taking some of that excellent public work and reprinting it at Silver Doctors. I very much appreciate that. Uh, yeah, the site a large part is, is free for people to interact and, and use the forums and talk about anything they want. But there's also, yeah, it's 10 bucks a month, 50 cents a day to talk about the uh, analysis of the stock market. We do a podcast every day. We do uh, different posts each day trying to stay on top of all this stuff. And that's kind of what my job is. It's like you guys is to try to stay on top of it and keep people informed. And so I encourage everybody to check it out at uh, tfmetalsreport.com. All right. Uh Craig Hemke of tfmetalsreport.com. It's always uh, great to have you back, Turd. Doc, it's always great fun. And thank you and thank Eric, and hopefully we can do this again soon. All right. For the Doc and Eric Dubin, thanks for tuning in to this week's SD Weekly Metals and Market.